The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Avantios Investments Limited, ABN 20096259979, AFSL 2455331, AIL, and Colonial First Aid Investments Limited, ABN 980024835252, AFSL 232468, CFSIL, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm David Pritchard, Executive Director of RAP at Colonial First State and responsible for our new innovative platform, CFS Edge. As technology progresses at rapid pace, the effective adoption of it has the potential to be a real game changer for practices, and undoubtedly it's going to play an increasingly important role in advice going forward. In this series, we uncover how technology can be used to drive competitive advantage, reimagine your client value proposition, and support continuous improvement. Welcome to episode three in our series on technology and innovation so you can enhance your client experience. I'm Sasha Lutkowski, and I'm excited to get into this episode where we'll be exploring a very hot topic, delving into the world of artificial intelligence and how advisors can leverage the power of AI in their practices. Joining me today is Jerome Bavalda, Chief Operating Officer at Colonial First State, and Peter Warren, Joint Managing Director of Finura Group. So let's get started. Jerome, what's been your journey in financial advice, and what does a day in the life of Jerome look like? Hi, uh, Sasha. Uh, thank you, and thanks for having me. Uh, look, my my journey in financial advice stems back over many years, uh, uh, and it started in uh, in the Netherlands, in Europe, where I worked uh, at professional services, working with wealth managers and asset managers, and then I joined uh, Westpac BT uh, in Australia. A uh, long time ago, I uh, spent some time in Asia as well, working with uh, planners and agents uh, over there for large organizations. I recently returned to Australia, and it's great to be great to be back here in Australia, where uh, we've got such a rich, yeah, wealth management industry and uh, and great great practices and, and a great climate. I must say, although it has been a bit freezing as of uh, recently, so uh, so a typical day in the life for me. Uh, it is quite mixed. Most of the days I check in on our large transformation programs. So uh, within CFS, I'm responsible for operations, technology, transformation, digital innovation. And of course, when you're working on large transformation programs, you want to make sure that you stay right on top of that. Also, I will look at the, uh, the, the various operational metrics, making sure that we deliver a good experience to advisors and customers. And I do like to very regularly, I, I'm sitting in the middle of the call center, so I do like to hop on the on the on the phones to just understand whether we're we're giving those good experiences to advisors and and clients on a daily basis. Finally, we have been working on a quite exciting innovation, which I'm sure we'll come back to later on, particularly around using AI generally and Gen AI specifically. And uh, I'm just passionate about those types of capabilities, so I'll typically try to. Have a, have a look over the shoulders of the team working on that to see how they're progressing, how close we are to um, uh, with our experiments in that space. Excellent, excellent. We're going to come back to all of that. That is the purpose of today's podcast. So, Peter, your career also has been really, really focused on financial advice. So what drives you in your role as the Joint Managing Director of Finora Group? Yeah, well, my you're quite right. It's entirely been in wealth management, um, and I didn't choose this career. I think like most people, uh, it's sort of... It shows me. Um, about 22 years ago, I uh, was doing a business degree and I desperately needed a proper job for a bunch of reasons. Um, things going on in my family at the time and a job was offered to me, a job called a paraplanner at Suncor Bank back in 2000. And I had no idea what a paraplanner was. And I said, that sounds awesome. Sign me up. 
I've never looked back. Uh, so I've been a power planner. I've spent time as an advisor. I then moved into the product manufacturing side of the industry, a bit of time insurance. I've done a lot of strategy roles. Uh, but for the last 10 years, I've been in technology. So my entire life is you know, sort of taking those learnings, understanding what happens in the coalface from an advice context. But um, I've surrounded myself with a bunch of really clever people and we do advice tech now. All right. So, listeners, we have two of the best guests we could possibly have on this episode. So, let's start really high level with, you know, what is AI, right? This is, this is, it's, it's sweeping the profession. It's sweeping the world right now. So, Jerome, you did mention, you know, generative AI. So, let's start there. What What is AI from a broad point of view? And then we'll sort of deep dive into it. So, so Peter, what, what is AI for you? AI is a a combination of a few technologies, I suppose, which sort of started at machine learning. And AI has been around for a long, long time, actually. It's just that this new idea of generative AI has sort of become, you know, into the sort of the vernacular or the daily use of all of us. But um, effectively, AI, from my perspective, is just a set of technologies that um, effectively help computers learn and adapt uh, which is not how we built software historically. Computers have always been quite, you know, ones and zeros, and you program the computer what to do. Well, now computers have the ability to learn and do things themselves, and that is how I. That's how I explain AI to my mum. Okay, <laughs> so I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, Jerome, how would you explain AI to your mum? <laughs> oh, good. Uh, uh, no, not that dissimilar to what Peter has just said. I think the the big difference is that AI. I think uh, it's already. Was was mentioned in the late sixties, seventies. Yes, had been around for a long period of time, and and I think as usual, uh, people overestimate how these technologies impact us over two years, but underestimate how they impact us over the medium to long term. And that's what we're seeing with AI at the moment. Uh, machine learning, deep learning have been capabilities where computers can self learn um, and kind of use. An unlimited number of factors. Yeah. So whilst we look at um, at learning, maybe through a few factors, they can process millions or billions of factors in order to derive an answer uh, or the best possible answer. Generative AI, the the real yeah next generation of AI come in over the last couple of years. Uh, it's it's almost like magic. Yeah. I think you type a question and you almost feel like another human is giving you or in a Harvard educated. You know, the professor is giving you an answer because it basically knows a lot about almost any topic you can imagine. So if you look underneath the cover, though, it's just really good at predicting the next word. So if you, if you keep that in mind, uh, so generative AI is just a really good predictor of the next word. And that's how they're able to string together a paragraph or a text or an essay, as my children like to use it uh, for their schoolwork as well. Uh, we need to monitor that, Peter, because uh, I think uh, that there's clearly limitations to uh, to the use of that in that sector. But um, uh, but yeah, it is it is a really useful capability, and I think it will be quite profound for that. It felt like quite a profound change over the last couple of years. So we'll see how that plays out, but uh, we're working on it hard. Well, it's interesting you should say that it feels like a, a profound change over the last couple of years because it does all of a sudden feel like everything is about AI. You know, and we, there's always early adopters, then there's always the bulk, you know, that, that then joins. But why why has it suddenly skyrocketed when, you know, you said, Jerome, it's kind of been around since the 60s and 70s. Jerome, why, why do you think it's skyrocketed all of a sudden? Look, I think it has to do with, with I remember when ChatGPT came out and I started to use it immediately because I've been following this space for a long period of time, and particularly I was always in the financial advice wealth space, and, um, and I thought this this could be something meaningful for us. Uh, and for for all the listeners that have used themselves, you know, when you type in your first question, uh, you are quite surprised actually by the quality of the answer that you get back. And so I think that has attracted just a lot of attention because this has been one of the fastest adoptions of new technology ever. Yeah, if you if you think through how many people started to use ChatGPT. Within the first couple of months, uh, that is faster than the adoption of an iPhone. That's faster than the adoption of the internet. That is faster than adoption of almost anything else that you can imagine. So obviously, this is something that doesn't need to be pushed onto people. This is something that people really want and really are keen and enjoy using. So in terms of technology implementation, uh, that is just a huge benefit because uh, typically... 
Peter, you can attest to this. Typically, we're trying to convince people to use new technology. Uh, this is something that people, you know, are using, even if it's not safe or even if it's not controlled or those types of things. So our biggest challenge has been to create a safe environment rather than to get people to uh, to adopt it so far. I think the thing I'd add to that too, it's it's also created more market capitalization value of any other technology in the shortest period of time in history. It's unprecedented. Um, you know, Apple released their AI equivalent uh, a couple of weeks ago. In one day, they added the market capitalization, combined market capitalization of the big four banks in Australia, just wow. with announcing a few AI features on their phones. So, yeah. you know, this this is the gold rush of all gold rushes when it comes to um, technology investment. And I think that's why we're getting inundated with AI right now. <laughs> Yeah, right. Very interesting. It's yeah, absolutely. And I know the term "unprecedented times" is a bit, you know, worn now. <laughs> We've heard it a lot in the past mm. few years, mm. but it is. It's a, it is a fascinating time. So let's let's talk then about how AI is currently being used by financial advice businesses. Now that could be globally or Australian. And we've we've got, you know, the interesting perspective of Jerome having potentially a European perspective to give us. But Peter, what are you seeing with how AI is currently being used by financial advice businesses? Yeah, so we're still getting a handle on just how widespread the adoption is. But but our current data shows that um, we survey advisors. So fifty percent of advisors are now using AI in their businesses. Okay, to some extent. Um, now the majority of that is will probably be personal usage of AI, using ChatGPT for content generation, um, social media, you know, those sort of things, helping advisors write. And let's face it, some of us aren't actually good writers. So it is, and it is very good at that. Um, but probably the most prolific, um, you know, usage we've seen is definitely around uh, recording and transcription and file noting, um, as an example, is probably where people are really interested at the moment. Um, but that said, there is still some way to go on getting these tools um, broadly adopted and integrated. We find it, most people I would describe them in the experimentation and curiosity stage. They're not in the embedded stage just yet. What we have found with uh, with our advisors and, and uh, using our platforms, and of course we organize seminars and, and, uh, and public discussions on this. Uh, we had a whole bunch of advisors over to the uh, Microsoft Technology Center here in, in Marketplace not long ago. And they shared, uh, similar to yourself, Peter, uh, some of the observations as to how they're using AI. Uh, uh, some of the use cases we, we have seen with advisors are indeed around um, uh, read productivity, meeting capture, drafting of communications, those types of things, which is what Cobot, for example, is very good at. Uh, we also have seen some use cases around uh, processing client information and, and, and uh, because, again, that is uh, typically... A, a quite a manual process for a lot of advisors still because you get that information on multiple formats, multiple um, uh, different channels adding to your organization. And so helping with that. And then finally, I think some are now thinking about knowledge management. And I think that's where some of the more sustained benefit may come from as well. Uh, we, we work in a very complex industry with lots of legislation, regulation, which gets updated all the time. So trying to stay on top of that is not easy. And um, where generative AI is very good is in processing large amounts of unstructured and structured information. And so I think uh, some financial advisors are already seeing the benefit of that for their practices as well. Yeah, absolutely. And look, that those that totally reflects what we're seeing on the Ensemble platform. You know, you're seeing advisors ask about these sorts of things, file note capabilities, like you said, just taking the complex, large chunks of information that advisors will get out of a fact find meeting and just being able to categorize, collate that, that's just a massive time saver. Are we seeing anything different in the global financial advice market? You know, we can we know that, for example, the US generally with their technology adaptation can be a little bit ahead of some of the smaller markets like Australia. Are we seeing anything different over there or what we can potentially expect that will come for financial advisors here? Yeah, we're absolutely seeing more prolific AI applications being rolled out for wealth management. Um, I would say the majority would fall into more of the investment management, portfolio management category, um, where uh, wealth managers in the US particularly are using AI to run portfolios now, effectively. Um, in some cases, um, 
to with varying degrees of success, I might add. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons we see that obviously is because the addressable market is obviously ten times what it here is in Australia, and there's huge amounts more capital in those markets to invest in technology AI companies. So that's where the tech's kind of coming from. I think uh, uh, you know one, one thing I would say is though that that market is broadly less regulated than Australia. So advisors are still under a very tight regulatory regime. The licensee structure in itself creates that. They don't have that over there necessarily. So there's a lot more onus on the small business. So we tend to see a bit more innovation experimentation because of that. Conversely, though, the um, the ASIC equivalent of the SEC has already prosecuted a number of independent financial advisors in the US for making misleading claims about their AI uh, technology that they're using as part of their investment proposition. So that, that term is known as AI washing, quite popular do now. So um, as much as we see the experimentation, experimentation and innovation, we're also seeing a lot of um, uh, you know vaporware as well. <laughs> That's part of the cycle. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, and Gerard, I was going to say, do we do you have any insights from an Asian or a European p- perspective on on how they might be rolling out AI in their wealth management businesses? No, it's 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 similar to what Peter said. I think there is a fair amount of AI washing happening uh, where people, because of those, yeah. When quite frankly, I think AI is being mentioned now in uh, in over sixty percent of shareholder meetings. Yeah, if you can't mention what you're doing on AI, then the questions will be asked. So everybody's trying to window dress their AI capabilities. Yep. And 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 quite frankly, in quite a few cases, it is nothing special. It's what they have been doing before, whether that is uh, yeah, analytics, uh, data analytics, other things that they now term AI. So, so watch out for that one because there's a lot of inflated stories out there. But there's some genuine use cases. I think some fund managers take some benefit in the asset management space, both in uh, Asia, Europe, as well as in um, in the US. Um, things like sentiment analysis. Again, think through processing a large amount of information, which is very hard to do manually, uh, will provide some extra inputs for the asset management process and asset allocation process. So that is, that is useful and genuine. Um, in terms of financial planning, I- I'm sure that a lot of advisors may, may look at this as another threat. We spoke about robo-advisors, and I've been looking at that topic for a long period of time, and this may be the next wave of, um, of innovation that, uh, that some deem to be threatening in terms of providing financial advice. Personally, I believe it's the opposite. I believe that uh, these types of technologies will augment the process and will make the process more efficient and help human financial advisors to be... Um, more effective in terms of providing advice because you have got, in principle, you will be able to tap into information and knowledge more easily uh, than uh, than you have been doing in the past. Uh, but I, I I know from experience that uh, the end investor and the members of our super innovation funds, they do really value that human-to-human contact. So I always see it as an augmentation rather than a replacement in terms of, uh, of those capabilities. And when I was in the US last year, uh, I think... Most organizations think about it that way as well. They don't think it as a um, as a uh, as a standalone, self directed capability. They see it very much as a human in the loop, as they call it, um, a supportive capability. Well, I mean, you know, we might have heard this said before, but Microsoft kind of they really got the name of their their AI right with Copilot. It's not meant to be a human replacement. It's meant to be your Copilot. It goes and gets the information. You get the final say. You, the human, get the oversight. It's it's a co-pilot. So they they really got the branding. They got the name on that spot on for what we want it to ideally be. I think I think we're still feeling our way through that. Though. I mean, even Microsoft, you know, arguably made a bit of a misstep a few weeks ago. They they launched some new um, computers, some new hardware. They're moving into the vertical model of building. You know, they have their own computers and now their own chips. And you know, part one of the features was that it would literally record and record every bit of data on your device, including what's on your screen, your clicks, the whole bit, um, almost creating a time machine for your computer. And they've actually backtracked from that only a week after announcing that technology because a lot of their enterprise customers said, no, we're not we're not happy with that. And a lot of their personal customers. So even Microsoft who actually have absolutely nailed it. They're one the second most valuable company in the world by a stretch now. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're still capable of making missteps with us. We, we don't know how people are going to respond until we actually release some of these features. And um, the idea of an AI tracking every single thing we're doing on our computers all times of the day is, is probably a little bit much for some. Yeah. Yeah. 
I agree with that. So that sort of you know leads nicely into the okay. So what are the challenges and opportunities for advisors in this space? Now that's a massive question, right? So let's break it down first and say, well, what are the big opportunities for advisors in you know using AI? even just a little bit in their business. Jerome, what do you see as some of the major opportunities here? I can tell you what we're working on, and then maybe that will help scope the mm. uh, the set of opportunities. And, and it's frank to say that we're still uncovering where this technology, with new technologies like this, quite frankly, at the start, you don't know yet exactly where the value is going to be created. And in CFS, we've taken very much an approach where we've created a safe environment for our staff to experiment. We're doing some um, uh, other experimentation with partners like Microsoft and Evernote and others. Uh, and uh, I've stayed away from trying to put a business guys on it. I've, I've stayed away from trying to make sure that there's a return on investment on those things. I believe that that will come over time. But more importantly at the moment is that we learn how to use the, this technology. Uh, we experiment as much as possible and what has become clear to me is that uh, it is very potent, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples in a minute, uh, but it all comes down to making sure that your data is is up to scratch, and so making sure that you've got really strong foundational data, and that won't come overnight. I think we, we have not stored data in a way that it is conducive to be used by these types of technologies, so we need to work on that, making sure that We've got a good organization of data, structured, unstructured. We take that information because it becomes easier to read for, uh, for for example, Gen AI technologies. And we need to become much better in asking the right questions. You know, the, the quality of the answer is mostly determined by the quality of the question. So we need to get much better in what we call prompting, or prompt engineering. And then that will be something that we will need to train staff on and we need to discover and then we'll get much better answers out of those technologies. Where we're using it at the moment is we've got a technical services area uh, under Craig Day, which a lot of our advisors are highly valued service. And, and, and Craig and his team are always inundated, particularly this time of year, with technical questions because the superannuation and taxation landscape in Australia is really complex. And they uh, there are typically phone calls about you know, 30, 40 minutes uh, to work through the very complex you know, technical question from advisors uh, working behalf of their their members or investors, and um, and uh, they they draw on a a database of about twenty six technical guides, about fifteen hundred pages of of yeah really sophisticated insights on on the superannuation and taxation landscape here. And what we've done, we basically put Gen AI on top of that, it ingested all that information. And start to ask questions and kind of iterate it through in order to uh, see what what how close we could get to uh, to answering some of those questions uh, that we get on a daily basis from advisors and try to scale the team and make their work more efficient so they can help more advisors and therefore more clients in the process as well. Uh, we've seen some great results results that Greg Day, the leader of that team, has been very excited about, but also a little bit startled because it's like, wow, you know, kind of that is actually quite an accurate answer. Having said that, this is not a press the button and the answers will come out. Uh, it needs what we call refinement, trimming. Uh, we need to we need to think through whether one Gen AI is enough, or we need to have another Gen AI monitoring that AI in order to get those answers refined and make sure we we have all the references to back up those answers in in the uh, in the technical guides that we have underneath. So uh, we've we've made good inroads into that, and we're getting pretty close to answering simple and medium questions, but it's still struggling on complex questions. So um, so that's that's where we are. And if you project that back to to an advisor office and an advisor practice, it's not that different. I think they were faced with you know, relatively simple questions by uh, their uh, clients, and uh, and Jenny I will be able to help them with uh, answering simple questions or simple scenarios. Uh, when it comes to more complex cases, you've got to be very careful how you use Gen AI. You need to make sure you check and you monitor. Uh, even if you write a simple letter, uh, if, you, if you use it for other purposes, uh, making sure that there is a human in the loop uh, to, uh, to validate and uh, monitor and supervise the answers before you use that, either internally or externally. Excellent. There's just so much to unpack there. So I just want to touch on a couple of things that I think advisors, you know, would 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 want to consider in their business. So you've said 
you know, ultimately the data that you need has to, you have to have a strong data foundation. And I mean, that's often where we find the issues with these things like bots, for example, right? So if you've got an AI bot that's crawling your data, if the data isn't good, it's not the bot's fault. In a lot of cases, this stuff is is built very well. The code is not a problem. It's the data that it's pulling from is incomplete, is 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 not clean, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it comes back to that, you know, very strong concept in IT and all of that garbage in, garbage out, unfortunately. So, you know, advisors, that's one of the challenges is we're going to have to really focus on making sure the data that we're pulling from is very, very top notch, which like you said, is a whole exercise in itself. And also then training any AI models you put in place, especially the large language models, LLMs, to make sure that those models speak the language of of your business. You know, so all of these things, it's really good to have these tools and overlay them on your business. But again, if the foundation isn't there, it's not going to get you the results that you want. And I think that we're going to be seeing that sort of more and more with some of your AI tools like file note, you know, uh, takers and um, transcription services and all that. That's that's a different type of AI, right? But it's those ones that you're using to create the database of knowledge in your business. If you don't get the foundation right on that, it's not going to produce the results that you want. So there's all of these cases coming out of chat GPT where chat GPT is just making up sources, just citing sources that actually don't exist. Uh, and when you call it out, you say, well, actually, you know, chat GPT, that source doesn't exist. It'll say something like, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I just made that up. So, you know, it, it knows it doesn't exist, but it's trying to solve your query. So that's this AI hallucination. So really, really a, a lot of stuff to consider when embedding these models in your businesses, but all you can overcome all of them. It just takes a bit of work in the beginning. So Peter, I mean, do you see any other sort of challenges that advisors should be aware of? Uh, on top of all of that. It sounds like a lot. But yeah. no, I don't want to, we don't want to freak advisors out. But you know. but I'm, and I'm seeing a bit of a trend of almost FOMO behaviour where advisors feel if they're not using AI at the moment, they're behind the game and they start just randomly using things. So that's probably the... So look, um, real practical. First thing we tell our clients to do is to start using Microsoft Teams and record all your internal meetings day one. So that doesn't impact the client, but all of a sudden you've now got a rich database of meeting logs of such. And so for Nura, that's what we do. We record everything. So I can query our entire co-pilot, can query any meeting that's happened in the last um, nine months since we turned it on um, and find out exactly what happened with a particular client. So that's awesome for that. It gets better and better the more users. So that's a simple thing that everyone should just sort of look at doing. Um, I think when we talk about using AI in a client context, that's when things get a little bit more challenging. So the um, first thing is, there's sort of t- two things to consider. Um, firstly, as a if you are a licensee in an AFSL, you do have a responsibility to, pr- to protect your client's data. So you have cybersecurity responsibilities and you have data privacy um, issues as well. Now, um, there are still, uh, certainly with enterprise AI, so obviously you're using Microsoft's AI, you've got a lot of comfort there that you're using something. But if you're using something little out of left field um, and you don't have good due diligence on that technology, you are putting yourself potentially at risk of either inadvertently leaking client information or some other you know, um, sort of risk from that perspective. The second thing that's coming up uh, increasing conversations is a more an ethical one, which is about to what degree do we disclose to our clients that we're using AI as part of our service model and delivery? Um, and look, not for us to judge there where the technologists, but I think it's reasonable to assume that clients would want to know if, if any element of their personal information has been used to, you know, in the AI models, even if it was just internally. And I think that in time we will see uh, financial services guides and other things updated to say, hey, this practice will use generative AI, you know, in a secure way and this is how, or at least clients will ask questions about that. So they're, they're probably the two things that we see at the moment. And, and and as per usual, this is I don't feel like this is something you should necessarily wait for um, legislation or regulation. Um, we saw how long it took for crypto to be regulated in this country. Uh, I, I feel AI is the same because simply, let's face it, the government is just not up to speed on this stuff. They do not have the legislative capability to you know, regulate simple industries, let alone something like AI, uh, which is multi-ge- multi-geography, all, all those kind of things. One example, I think when uh, when ChatGPT came out, um, we very quickly were able to detect that some of our staff members were using that uh, for personal reasons, uh, mostly. 
we immediately interfere in that because if you use, to your point, Peter, if you use some kind of AI capability and you haven't done property diligence, you're likely going to use something uh, that is uh, using a public data set. What that means is that whatever questions you ask or whatever documents you ingest or you expose to it ends up in a public domain. So think through personally identifiable information. Uh, that is not something that you would like to end up in the public domain. Uh, so we were very conscious of that. Uh, rather than you know cutting the use of AI off for everyone instantaneously, uh, we did cut it off for ChatGPT and say, yeah, don't use that for... Uh, even for personal purposes, in, when you're in an office environment, which you do at home, we can't we can't regulate, obviously. But uh, but in an office environment, we've we've um, as we call it, blacklisted that. But instead of doing you know kind of closing it all altogether, we immediately opened up an environment for them to experiment uh, with um, sanctioned uh, AI capabilities that are fulfilling all of our requirements around information security. Uh, cyber controls, uh, sitting on a safe environment, uh, a private environment so that the information doesn't go outside of our perimeter of, of our systems uh, architecture. And uh, and so, and what we're now finding is that some of the people are using our corporate AI tools for personal purposes, which I'm absolutely fine with. Yeah, I think uh, we had some of our people write a birthday message for their, uh, for their husband or for their wife. And they were proudly showing that to other staff members. And I think that's a great sign uh, because it means that people are adopting it, that they're using it, that they're learning, that they're becoming familiar with this technology, which will over time become pervasive. And, and, and so for me, that's a much better situation using corporate tools for personal use rather than using you know, kind of um, uh, public tools for, for cor- corporate use. So, uh, so that's where, where we uh, our strategy to try to uh, contain uh, and and regulate this this capability within CFS. Yeah, and I don't think that advisors. I think advisors have heard enough about that sort of um, concern to be aware of it. I guess the question is, if we're talking about information security, and advisors want to use something like ChatGPT, we'll just call it that because that's the common one that everyone knows, right? So if they want to use something like that and an advisor doesn't have the scope, capability, budget to create their own corporate internal tool like that, what is an advisor's option to use something like ChatGPT for, let's call it more sensitive information, right? If you're going onto ChatGPT to get an, write an article for your blog, that's a whole other discussion, right? But what are advisor's options when they want to use something like that, but they have to put in somewhat sensitive private information. So we we advise our clients, um, the majority will be using a form of um, Microsoft Enterprise or Business Enterprise version of Microsoft 365. Within that, there is a co-pilot feature. Um, you can use that co-pilot feature through your Edge, Microsoft Edge browser, or even within the Teams application, there's a little tab now with co-pilot. Uh, so you can actually use that as an interface for AI, and it can actually use your own content as well in a business. You can reference files and everything. So we, we would advise um, and we train our clients uh, to sort of train their staff to say, hey, these are the right places that you use AI. This is where you're safe. Um, it uses, the, the term is co-pilot for Microsoft 365, and then you've got absolute assurance that that data is being kept where it should be kept. Yeah. For those that don't know, ChatGPT is actually, Copilot and ChatGPT is the same thing. Yeah, so it's open AI. Uh, so the, the big difference is that ChatGPT, as you use it publicly, it, it, it's, it's in the public domain. With Copilot, it is part of the Microsoft Enterprise capability, and therefore it's it's protected and, uh, and secure. Um, more broadly, even within CFS, and even though we have, um, you know, more, uh, capital to throw these types of things than some of our some of our advisor practices and and, and advisor groups. Uh, w- we still focus very much on what we call leveraging uh, native AI capabilities, uh, so system native AI capabilities. So, for example, Microsoft, you've got um, capabilities like that, but also in other systems, whether it's Oracle or or Adobe or other things. Uh, yeah. So typically when you use a corporate suite of systems, uh, almost every provider, um, self-respecting provider will be offering some AI capabilities. Those types of capabilities are generally safer to you. Still do your due diligence, make sure uh, it's private rather than public. Uh, but those uh, system native capabilities are uh, are far more efficient to use 
Uh, and even for CFS, we're not aiming to set up our own large language models. If you think through how those large companies with very big market caps, you know, the amount of dollars they invest in, and it's not um, hundreds of thousands, it's not millions, it's billions of dollars. Yeah. And so, uh, so even in a CFS, that's definitely not the type of money uh, we can afford to throw at, uh, at these types of capabilities. So, uh, routing the, to- the, 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 uh, uh, the cocktails of, of very large organizations that invest a lot of money in these types of things, we believe is a far more efficient way to, uh, to experiment with, uh, with uh, generative AI. Yeah, and that's probably the hot tip for us too, in, in from a cost perspective. Like, you know, every day I turn on one of our applications and there's now AI features. So Drone said, you know, Adobe Acrobat has an AI capability now. That's right. Slack, Slack, which is an internal messaging system we use it for now, has AI in it. Um, Salesforce has AI in it now. So it's I feel we we really feel feel for the best way to think about AI is as a feature, not a product. So um and so it is one of those times where contrary to what you'd think a technology consultant would say, it's not a bad idea to just take a step back, see what the roadmaps look like for our major technology suppliers over the next six to 12 months before you go to head into something like partnering with a small startup that may be doing something which looks quite cool, but in reality will become um, quite a ubiquitous feature in the not too distant future. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that scares either of you about this AI capability for financial advice? We've sort of touched on things like transparency, data protection, all that. But is there anything that really sort of scares you about AI? There's, there's two things that scare me. One is in a professional context. I, I, I think AI has already shown that um, cyber scamming is going to be so much more effective using AI. So the quality of phishing emails has become unbelievably good um, that we've seen. And the ability, particularly using voice um, voice recognition and creation software, the ability to impersonate is going to become quite easy. I mean, it's already here, right? So I think advisors are going to have to adopt new practices to verify that the person they're talking to is indeed their client. It's going to get harder to distinguish that. It's probably one key thing. Um, and I'm sure the big banks are all over this stuff. I'm sure CFS are as well. That, that's that's a, that's a thing for me. So financial advisors are a very soft target for cyber, I can tell you right now. Um, the second one is probably more of a personal one, to be honest. I've got a five-year-old and seven-year-old boy, Tommy and Patrick, and well, so I, I, I think we maybe will have dodged the scourge of social media bullet with their generation might be a bit more awake to it. I do worry about AI and the impact on young people, um, the ability to distinguish what's real and not real, the ability to be curious for your own set and your own creativity. Yeah, nice one, Peter. Yeah, now the, um, uh, you touched on on the cyber and information security. That's a huge topic within CFS. We see the threat of AI and Gen AI specifically in terms of indeed phishing, account takeover, um, fraud. Um, we also see the opportunity of it because uh, using AI and Gen AI will allow us to monitor and detect um, uh, very different things that we've been able to do today. So, so it's it's kind of we see both the the threat and the opportunity of the capability. Uh, and it's fair to say that, uh, unfortunately, not every practice or every advisor uh, may have the capabilities to do that. So again, look for industry solutions that uh, offer you these types of protections. So rather than try to reinvent the wheel uh, yourself, because that is uh, that is horribly expensive. Uh, the other one uh, is um, make sure you keep a human in the loop at the moment. And I can't stress that enough. So be very aware uh, that at the moment, uh, these capabilities will need supervision and monitoring and uh, and a human oversight uh, before it leaves the gate. Uh, finally, uh, Peter, I, uh, I similar to yourself, I'm a little bit further ahead with them and the kids. They use uh, they use it more than I do. Yeah, I try to use it as much in the workplace as I can, but my kids are huge fans of uh, of using uh, AI, generative AI. And the one tip I have for for the listeners is that again, with 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 if you use it in a home scenario, I think it's very capable. But make sure uh, that there is actually still learning happening. Use it to research better, and it's a fantastic research tool. Yeah, uh, it's almost like having a Harvard graduate educated in any topic possible walking next to you, and you asking them questions. Uh, so it's a great research tool. But yeah. 
monitoring and, and learning still needs to be preserved. So, uh, so I think that there's a good parallel there between yeah the personal space and the corporate space. Now times have changed since we all just had a bookshelf with Encyclopedia Britannica on it. Right? Those? <laughs> that was a competitive advantage having Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> my parents bought a you know a whole set. I think my dad still got some of those. <laughs> collectors, collectors items. <laughs> Excellent. Love this. Now, look, we have spent a bit of time telling advisors what they need to be aware of, mm-hmm. like, the, you know, just be careful of this. But look, w- the reality is we know that AI, you know, is going to be empowering financial advisors, right? So where are the opportunities? What are the real opportunities coming to help advisors, you know, lower their costs to serve, increase efficiencies, mitigate mistakes? Peter, what are you seeing and what do you see as the as the big opportunities for advisors here? Yeah, so the North Star for every advice business we talk to is increasing the number of clients they can serve per advisor. We do not have enough advisors in this industry to serve uh, the 26 million Australians, um, so we need to grow that component. So that is a that is the goal we align behind it. So to, to enable that to happen, we need to find uh, more efficient ways for advisors to communicate with clients en masse, more efficient ways to generate relatively personalized communications to advisors, uh, to clients en masse, and generative AI can provide that um, that capability. Absolutely. So um, that that is a real opportunity. Um, we do believe things like transcription of file notes and those things are a really useful uh, tool for advisors because we know a lot of businesses still do a lot of handwritten notes and hand it to an assistant who then types it in. Like You'd be amazed at <laughs> what still happens. So even just for advisors to get into the habit of recording client meetings is a really good thing to do, um, you know, in terms of because it's always going to transcribe better than probably what you would in the meeting. Uh, I think from a, a adoption perspective, we, we are going to see, um, we talk about data cleansing, that's a big issue. Um, there is incredible new features coming through many of the enterprise CRMs, which will enable data cleaning to be more efficient. So one of the CRMs that we use at Fenura now has a data completion AI built into it. So it'll standardize all our field formats for us correctly. Things like phone numbers, when there's always different formats people use, it'll standardize that using AI, which is bloody amazing, right? So um, I think- AI will help us clean our data better. It'll help us communicate with clients more efficiently. And one of the things we're really keen to see is that um, we tend to communicate in the way we want to be communicated with. And one of the wonderful things that AI can do is it can help you put um, complex ideas into terms that maybe an individual would understand in their frame of reference. And so where I've seen some wonderful use cases um, for our financial advice businesses is where they've taken bits of content that they would use in, let's say, positioning a statement of advice. They might send an email to a client saying, here's your statement of advice. But they'll maybe use AI and they'll prompt the AI to say, um, this is my client. Um, you know, she was a school teacher for 30 years. She's got limited financial knowledge, but she's really into, but she's a really creative person. Can you help me explain <laughs> a couple of key concepts to her in some terminology that she would understand? AI is wonderful for that. And I think, um, you know, we talk, uh, I know things like diversity, inclusion are buzzwords, but actually AI can actually help you have a more inclusive way of communicating with a diverse client base, which if you think about it, if we're going to serve go from 100 clients per advisor to 300, you're going to have a more diverse client base. So you're going to have to be better at communicating. And and I think um, that's the power of this for me. If there's one thing that I think an advisor, a power planner, at anyone, anyone in advice, no matter what your role can do to leverage generative AI tools is jump on Google and spend half an hour, an hour learning how to engineer the best prompts you can. That is an excellent use of your time because just going to a chat GPT or a similar, you know, model, a co-pilot, whatever, and saying, write me an article about this, it's not going to hit the mark for your clients, right? So if we're trying to hit your clients, it's not, it's just too generic. So spend yeah. some time learning what, how to engineer the best prompts and it will just absolutely skyrocket your interaction with AI. Jerome, what, what about you? What do you see as the opportunities here? for advisors in this AI space? Yeah, no, the, the, we, we think about the use of AI and general AI along, along a few dimensions. So the, uh, most people will start with some personal productivity. So recording meetings, summarizing meetings, coming out, the preparation, the minute taking, the summarization of, of communications. I think to your point, Peter, that's a really useful time saving. It's, it's probably not going to generate a lot of value, but it adds up because every time you don't spend half an hour kind of after the meeting 
you know, kind of summarizing and 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 uh, perfecting notes. You still, you're not going to cut it down to zero. You still need to review what comes out of it. But that's kind of personal productivity. I think is the first one where we see some um, some uplifts. Uh, the second one is indeed analytics personalization, and I think you you position that very well, um, Peter. If you do want to make something relevant for a client, then think about the other scenario. There is market information. There's research reports that you get. Generative AI is really really good in in consuming all of that information that is made available to you, or you know your fund managers provide you with lots of interesting information on on the different investment strategies that uh, that you may be using for your managed accounts or or anything else. Gen AI has been really good in kind of grabbing all of that information, saving you a whole lot of time, and literally with a click of a button, coming up with a draft uh, that may be specific to a client that you have. So it will give you a draft. I'll send that out directly to the client. You make sure you review it and you make sure it's um, it's uh, it's appropriate. But it will save you a lot of time reading all of that information. It will save you a lot of time producing you know, a personalized capability or a report for your client and it will make you look really good because you know suddenly you're using you know a tool in order to research more efficiently and to draft kind of specific client communications more efficiently as well so i think that's one area around analytics and and personalization and also think about it in terms of knowledge management so there is a lot of knowledge in advisor practices Uh, sometimes it is yeah with the most experienced uh, advisor, sometimes it's not very well documented. If you can get that information, that, that knowledge documented, everybody in the practice will be able to utilize that, utilizing Gen AI. So again, think through knowledge management in your practice. Uh, it doesn't always need to be structured. It could be just articles. You know, If you're writing articles anyway for, uh, for your clients or uh, for other purposes, uh, then store them in, for example, SharePoint or Microsoft. And if you use the co-pilot in Teams, you can just direct it to the, the 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 knowledge that you have in SharePoint. Could be unstructured articles, could be PDF, could be Word documents, could be Excel spreadsheets and graphs and everything else. I'll pick that up. I'll come back with uh, with uh, with with some insights on that. In the beginning, that's going to be quite rusty because um, you know, as as we said before, you do need to you know improve the data. You need to improve the questions in order to get better answers. Uh, but over time, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, improvements. Uh, in utilizing it in that way as well. All right. Look, let's uh, let's leave it there. This has been excellent. It's I'm sure it's going to leave our lo- listeners with a lot to think about, lots of takeaways and ideas today. Thanks so much, Peter and Joanne, for joining us and sharing your insights. And uh, be sure to tune into our next episode where we'll be exploring how to optimize your tech stack for growth. <laughs>